Okay, let's go to Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, God, we love and appreciate you. Thank you for your mercy, your grace, uh, your power, Father. We pray, God, that uh, we just be with this study tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Oh, 23 verses, amen. And 623 is the one you use on everybody, just about, amen. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a good one, isn't it? Let's just read the whole chapter through, because it's only 23 verses, and we'll get into the content. I get, I get the song. Yeah. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, likewise, verse 11, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead and beat unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity on iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness on the holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit on the holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see at the beginning right here what the chapter is about. The chapter deals with the sanctification of the believer or the death of Christians <coughs> as it deals with the death of Christ. It shows the justification of the believer with God does not give you a license to sin. We saw that. Now the union with Christ, it's not written up here, but I will be starting to put a whole lot up there probably. The union with Christ means we are dead to sin. What do you mean? You're dead to sin. You no longer have to sin. You just no longer have to. And uh, you go to verse 2. It says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? In other words, you don't have to. Look at verse 7. For he that is dead is freed from what? From sin. See, the hardest thing for uh, young men today to get, you know, teenagers all the way up, is character. Character teaches you that you do what's right, you don't do what you feel like doing. That's character. And if you don't have it, you've got to get it. If your parents never give it to you, you have to get it. It's just like if, if, if you work X amount of hours, you know how much sleep you have to have. If all of a sudden you stay in the bed for, 
for like 10 or 12 hours, you better tell your body there's something up with that because your body don't need that much. See, but your body will take as much as you give it. You have to learn how to operate that thing to tell your body even how when you're going to get up, what you're going to do. You have a hard day at work or something. Uh, we did that many times. You still got to drive home, don't you? Or you'll die in a car wreck. Okay, you come here. What does coming here do? It gives you character. It really does. It makes you have a schedule. It makes you have an intensive schedule to where you're telling your body, I know you're not used to this, but guess what, bud? This is the way it's going to be. Now, when sin takes, uh, uh, it, it talks about them members, that's every member, everything, everything protruding out of that torso right there, your ears, nose, mouth, you know, hands, fingers, and feet. Uh, it says you don't yield your members to unrighteousness. That means you have an absolute right you have a dominant right, you are a king of your body, to tell your body don't sin. As a Christian, you got that right. But the hard part is to break bad habits because the body's already used to doing all this bad stuff. So now you have to count, you have to reckon in your mind that this stinking body was dead with Christ. It died, man. That's it. Christ had complete control over everything. He's victor of the grave. He come up out of the grave. He's, got, he's living the newness of life on the God, and so do you. Now, to reckon that stuff in your brain is hard, though. And that's part of growing in the Lord, see? That's part of getting that scripture down, understand what it says, and just believing what it says and doing it. And um, not as easy as it seems. But you, uh, verse 11 says, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the union with Christ means we are dead to sin, the death to sin means to be free from the guilt or penalty of sin. Now watch it. But not from its influence. You understand? Just like today, tonight, last night, you had, you had influence. Amen? There's always influence. The influence is there. But the penalty and the guilt ought to be gone. See, when you enter into an agreement with your flesh to do wrong, then that guilt and that penalty comes back. Because you're living in the flesh. You're not living in the spirit. You understand that? That's what we call conviction of sin. When you do something wrong, you get convicted. Why did you do something wrong? You didn't have to do something wrong. No, you willfully went and did something wrong. Now, are you going to go to hell because you did something wrong? No. Because all that condemnation and all that, that, that uh, the penalty for that was paid for at Calvary by Jesus Christ. So you're not going to pay for none of that. It's already been paid for, the sin part. But in the flesh, you'll reap to your flesh what you sow to your flesh. If you smoke, you know, you got cancer. If you, you know, or, or, or emphysema, you know, you get alcohol, you get the liver problems. You get uh, some people that are back to getting the sensual sins, they'll get, a, you know, HIV, they'll get herpes, they'll get uh, syphilis, gonorrhea. I mean, there's stuff you're, and they could be saved, backslidden, put this flesh into something that wasn't supposed to, and you get burnt. And God's not going to come down and say, well, okay, you know, that's okay, son. You know, the flesh is not saved. But your inside is. And this entire chapter, you see, is a heavy chapter. And um, it's just like uh, it's just like sometimes people are used to going to bed late at night, like I was, because midnight's in the afternoon. Well, if I know I have to get up in the morning, then I have to judge, I have to realize how many hours I have, right? I have to say, well, okay, I'm good on five hours sleep. I'm good on seven hours sleep. And I, gotta, I, my, and, and, and I tell my body that, my body gets used to that. If it gets out of that kilter, you know, you'll feel it. Or if you think you can burn the candle on both ends, you'll feel it. You'll eventually get it. If you went to bed, for instance, this morning at 12, 1, 2 o'clock or something, and you had to get up for work at 5 or 6, then you're going to be wore out. Right? There's no way. That's why I tell people like on Sunday, you know, on Saturday night, be careful. Saturday night, stay up and watch them movies or watch something like that. Next thing you know, you're coming, you're worthless. In Sunday school, you're worthless in church. Well, then I shouldn't even come. No, you should come and get some character. And understand that the Bible's more important than your stinking flesh. You know, right? And you adjust yourself like that, and then God starts giving you power and starts, because you see what you're doing is you're yielding yourself. You're yielding all your members to him and not, not to that stinking flesh all the time. That's rough. The illustration, I'm just going through a lot of things here. I don't have it written down. But the illustration of union with Christ in death is the obedient act of believer's baptism. Look at verses 3 and 4. It says, Know ye not that so many of us, and I like, he's talking about Paul, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. 
Therefore we are buried with him, see that, by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. See what it says? That like as, like as Christ was raised up from the dead. That you, don't, you won't find water anywhere in there. It's talking about spiritual baptism, being baptized into Christ. So spiritually speaking, when you receive Jesus Christ, you were dead with him when he was buried, right? You died with him. The sin penalty was, was there. And you rose again from the dead with him. You actually did that 2,000 years ago when you said, I do now. Spiritually, you did that. When we baptize people in the water, to, to, as a figure of that, we tell you that you're buried in the likeness of his death and you're raised in the likeness of his resurrection to walk in newness of life. In other words, you reckoned yourself you uh, are like a clone of Jesus Christ. That's basically what it is. So whether we can go back 2,000 years, years or not in our brain, try to really believe, well, how can that really happen? You have to believe what God says happened. And you've got to stick with that. So that when that sin comes up and you start, start saying, oh, I can't quit, I can't quit, oh, you don't know me, you don't know the problems, all stuff, all we can do is take you back to the Bible and say, look, if you were saved, you've got power inside of you, inside of you to say no. If the body's that strong, and if you have that many problems, you better spend extra time in the Bible, you better spend extra time on your knees. Get God's power. Get God's victory. Sometimes people are so out of whack, you've got to put them in a home. You've got to get them away from the substance until that spirit can get that control of that body because that body's so strong. That mind is so strong. Those drugs are so strong. And uh, whether it's alcohol, drugs, or anything, these things, sometimes people got to be actually lick, uh, locked up and physically, physically, watch, you know, that they won't take this, they won't do this to their body, like Brother Roloff or that, and then after a while, they can get victory. Their spirit will start getting, getting better because that substance that was in their body that was so strong that made them, made them uh, want it is gone. Sometimes, though, the Lord, you can pray, and the Lord can just give you victory, too. But there is times when that happens. But the illustration of the union with Christ in death is definitely in verse 3 and 4. And the illustration of the union with Christ of his resurrection is also seen in baptism, according to verses 4 and 5. We read verse 4, and verse 5 says, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. See, there's no temporary anywhere in there. You don't see no temporary. You don't see anything like if, ands, or buts in this chapter. That's why the Pentecostals, the Charismatics, really do not like Romans. They don't, they don't study Romans. Uh, you know, it, it just boggles their mind. If you take them to Romans and show them this, that you put on Christ, right? You put off certain things. Uh, that you're baptized with Christ. Not you might be baptized with Christ, or maybe down the line you'll be baptized with Christ. No, no. When you got saved, you were baptized with Christ into his death, but also into his resurrection. There's no in-betweens. There's no temporary in here. There's no, uh, like I can lose it or anything. Like that. How in the world can you lose your salvation in chapter 6? You can't do that. This is talking about, Paul says, us. He includes himself. When you received the Lord Jesus Christ, you did it simply as childlike faith, that belief that come on you from the word of God. You heard it. You heard the salvation. You heard that gospel of your salvation. You received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And by doing that, him being in you now, and you in him, nobody can sever that. Nobody can. So if God can't do it, you can't do it. And the object of uh, chapter 6, like I said, was our sanctification of the believer. That's the believer being set apart for the use of God. And that's the heaviest chapter. If you want to memorize the chapter in the Bible, Romans 6 would be the chapter, because that will help you out a little bit to understand that uh, uh, what, what God's trying to do is show us that we do have, we do have dominion over this body if you want it. We really do. If you want it. The key is if you want it. When you wanted to be saved, you got saved. Now, you want to live for God, you got to want to live for God, right? you got to want to do things. That's the want to in there. And the um, Holy Spirit of God wants you to do these things. Wants you to be on fire for him. Wants you to stay on fire. But he also wants you to have that consistency. That's what people watch is consistency, you know. And that's real difficult to keep doing if you're not in the book, not praying, and uh, doing what you're supposed to do. The claims and penalty of sin have no more claim against Christ, neither has it claim against us, verses 6, and, six through 11. 
What do you mean? Just, just what I said. The claims and penalty of sin have no more claim against Christ. In other words, when God put that sin on Christ on the cross, when Jesus Christ suffered all that humiliation and took upon him the sins of the world, yours and my sin, he took it down, got rid of it, and guess what? They can't touch him no more. It was a sacrifice once, 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 that's it. So we're in Christ, so therefore guess what? When we're in Christ, we no longer have that penalty of sin either. If, they, if it can't touch Christ, it cannot touch us. And you find that through verses 6 through 11. It says, knowing this, and I know I'm going fast. I know some of you are tired. I know we had a big week, you know, too. And you get wore out and stuff like this. I understand that. And it is a Tuesday, amen. But uh, it's okay, Matt. If you, if you just fall out on your paper, we'll wake you up later. You'll have to get the notes from somebody else, amen. But I mean, really. I mean, that stuff happens. Your body gets wore out. But this is chapter 6. And if this is the 10th one, we've only got five weeks left, Amen. And uh, this is one of the deepest chapters of the Bible, 6 and 7. And so 6 through 11, I'll be saying some things soon, you'll get it. And if we got it, we'll have to take another week on it, and then, then uh, go a little uh, faster with the other stuff. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we, see that, see what the, the word after that says? Should not. It means you could. But it says you should not, what? I mean, you just should not. And you know what? Verse 6 starts off with it with a good positive thing. What does it say? Knowing. So you have to know this. Somebody says, well, when you get saved, you know all this stuff. No, you don't. No, you don't. Holy Spirit will speak to you and make you confused about some things because your brain ain't used to serving God. And uh, it'll tell you what's right and wrong. But a lot of times what will happen to Christians is they'll say, well, I, I just don't have any power. They don't see any power there. Well, I think I'm saved. I I think I am, but I just keep doing this. Until you come to the Word of gr God and you start growing with verses, and you understand that the Bible says knowing that you need to know some things, and you get this down in your head, you see, when that, when that new man, the new man already knows what's right. When your mind, when your, your little filthy old mind starts looking at this Word right here and it starts cleaning you up, and it starts saying you can know some things, and you see here that it says knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, then that means the old man is crucified with him. That means the flesh that you got on, on your rib cage right there, and that stick and nasty old heart, and that, and that mind right there was crucified with Christ 2,000 years ago. That is the penalty. But the influence can still be there. See, the old man is still there. But you have a dual nature now. You have a new man and an old man. So you have to know these things. You have to know that, that when that old man wants you to sin, that you don't have to sin. And you got a verse on it. So if that sin is so powerful that you can't stop doing it, you need to get on your knees somewhere and ask for power of God, you know, to, to get you some power, to get you something going, or you need to ask for some help or get the church to pray for you. You need some victory over some things. And, and that's like this RU will be starting at uh, uh, Reformers Unanimous there. And we start that. It's got booklets with scripture after scripture after scripture for, those, for any kind of problem, overeating, smoking, cussing, damn, whatever, man. Any of these members, it's got verses in there, and people, uh, uh, people get a hold of that, and you start using the Word of God against your flesh. And that's good. And that starts working. Verse 7 says, For he that is dead is freed from sin. And I remember my wife, we, we talked about that when I first got a hold of this, and she, it was hard for her. What do you mean I'm dead? I'm, I'm breathing. What are you talking about? How can I be freed from sin? I mean, I'm, how can I be dead? I'm talking to you. You're talking to me. You know, you get in that. No, you've got to reckon yourself dead. In other words, you've got to really believe that you have, con you have absolute control over this body because of Jesus Christ. You have to believe that all that power that went to the grave with Christ, uh, as far as the power of the sin, the power of the flesh, was, was crucified, it was killed, it was dead, and that's where it is. And I uh, only got two pages to go, amen? But uh, verse... Um, Verse 8, now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, once again, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead unto God, or to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through, through 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's the mediator of everything. <coughs> now, yielding to God, that's the hard part, isn't it? It's a negative and a positive admonition in verses 12 through 13. If it gets hot in here, let me know. I'll turn that on because I don't know if I'm fevering or if I'm just getting hot. But verses 12 and uh, 13, we're talking about yielding to God. It says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. See, that mortal body wants you to know that it's talking about the outside. That's just the way it is. Uh, somebody says, well, I got, a, I got a problem with certain kinds of sensual sins. Well, it's what irritates them, what, what excites you to these things. You know, you got, if you got bad magazines, you got bad books, or you're looking at certain videos, or, you know, Internet, you know, well, well, good night, man. Come on, Christian, can't you put that together? If you have something that lures you and makes you think bad, and then all of a sudden your body takes over control, right, and you're overwhelmed with a certain sin, then why would you keep doing the same thing to excite yourself to do the cer certain sin? It don't make sense. So God's saying, you're smarter than that. You know, some people, honest to God, can watch certain things, and I couldn't watch them. Some things I can watch, some things I can't watch. I'm blood and guts, honestly, so I, you know, I, can, I can probably get into a lot of that, you know. And but some people can watch other stuff, and, uh, and just certain things will, will it, you know, it's like the Holy Spirit's alarm. You know, alarm goes up and says, whoop, here we go. You're entering into this flesh level where you can't handle it. And then you'll say to yourself, wow, I can't handle it. And next thing you know, you turn it off. Next thing you know, those pictures or those things keep bothering you, 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 until finally your body becomes overwhelmed with the impulse to sin. And then your spirit doesn't, you know, spirit is quiet because we already grieved it. And then we premeditatively do something and we sin. And, and so we're talking about this, this yielding to God stuff. It says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. I mean, that is so self-explanatory. That is so easy. Right? That means your hands want to sin, don't do it. You know, any part of your body wants to sin, don't do it. Because when you yield to it, when you say, okay, then your body takes over every time. You know, it's almost like a, uh, almost like a, uh, uh, it's a weird kind of world when you're a Christian. It really is. Because sights can get you, smells can get you, um, music gets you. I mean, we're just trapped. We're trapped in a stinking body. And it, but it's a dead body. And so when, the, when, the, when it starts reacting to the smells or to the sights or to the, uh, the listening and, and, and it wants to do wrong, that's like a warning already, right? That is a warning already. So right there you have to decide whether you're going to yield your body to. Either to it or you're going to say, oh, Lord, help. Oh, Lord, please help. I'm sorry, Lord. See, it's that brain. All of a sudden you'll start thinking. And if you think about the wrong thing too long, boom, you do it. It's a tricky kind of a thing. But, um, but thank God God's got something in the Bible about it. Could you imagine none of this stuff was in the Bible? If chapter 6 was in the Bible, we go out of our cotton pick of mine. I'd be getting saved every day 20,000 times. I said, no way a saved man can think like this. No way a saved man can walk it. No way. There's no way. Because Christ never did that. But then he, thank God he put Peter and Paul in there and James and everybody else I can read about. And he put in their sins, and he put in how they messed up. And I can read that and say, well, I'm human. But then I can't use that as an excuse to sin. Why? Because of this right here. He says, don't yield yourselves, members. Now, if you're thinking about going to the Air Force or anything, Dan, you're going to have different temptations there, too. Because you're old boys, you know. Yeah. Yep, the same thing. But these guys are a little bit grown up, and they got liberty, and they'd be a little bit more stuff and more money. You know, have more toys, some of them. <laughs> And uh, you get around that, you're gonna have to, it's going to have to be where you have to get in with the right group. You have to get with the right, you know, with a local church or something, wherever you're at. And you just have to be faithful like that while you're in there. That's hard to do. That's a lot of pressure. You know, my Tim had a lot of pressure. Marine Corps is really heavy, macho stuff. Verse 13, <coughs> Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members, he includes that, you see that? As instruments of righteousness unto God. So somebody says, well, 
well, you can't use James or something like this, you know, with your works, you know, uh, you'll see your face and all that. Yeah, you can use all that. Why? Because that verse right there says yield your members unto what? Working for God. Working for God. Where you used to work for the devil, now you're working for God. Whether it's passing out tracts, whether it's helping some uh, young boy or young girl along, or, 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 you know, whatever you maybe didn't used to do before, you're doing now because of Jesus Christ in you. He's using your body. Now, now all of a sudden, the new man is making this old man do something. See, the old man's dead. That's why the new man can make it do right. But when you reckon in your mind that the power that's in here, whether it's lying, cheating, damning, cussing, or pride or whatever, all those sins of the mind, you know, the real deep heart there of the, of the old man, uh, you get them things going, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit says, that's wrong, that's wrong. You, you know, you hit the altar, or you, you, you just uh, do it in your home, or wherever you're at when it happens, you say, God, I need some help. I don't like what's going on right here. And uh, he helps you. He'll give you that power all of a sudden to get over this old man. And when that happens, it's called victory to a Christian. And the Christian says, well, man, bless God. But it don't stop with just one day at a time. I mean, with one day. It's the next day is a whole other battle, a whole other avenue, there are different giants to get. And uh, that's why in your mind you, you take them Old Testament stories and everything and you can spiritualize them because they're all given for end samples. And you can find out, you know, just like how Joshua went in and Caleb went in and took the promised land, goes in there, it's not heaven. Cain is not heaven, it's just the promised land. We know it's not heaven because of what? Because of the battles that they had in there. So we know as a Christian goes through there, we're talking about spiritualizing now. We're not talking about doctrine. But as you go through there, you can understand that you're going to have battles, you're going to have a Millicite, you're going to have all these giants around, you're going to have, man, it's going to be a mess. You're going to have a battle every day of your life. Why? Because you're in the stinking world. And it's, it's, this world's not ran by him. So the body is not the only source of sin, but it is the instrument of the manifestation of sin, according to verse 12. It says, let not, which is a negative. Verse 12 says, let not. That is definitely a negative. Sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body. You see? When you allow your instruments or your members to do sin, then it'll be manifested. Manifestation of sin is just something that's in your heart that you're allowing to get control. That's all. You're giving, you're giving way to your thoughts. You're giving way to your imaginations. You're giving way to just negative stuff that uh, the, the devil could be putting on you, the world could be putting on you, or just the flesh is putting on you. But you're listening to it. And you're, you're operating within that realm. And it's, and it's pretty soon it'll be manifest outside of your body. It'll definitely be there. You're either backslidden out of the church, uh, you're, you're, you're bitter, you're, 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 your mouth is running a thousand miles a, a minute, uh, talking about this bad thing and that bad thing, and you're cutting people down, and you're, you know, there's no edification, there's no grace, there's no mercy. None of those things are manifested. Just the sins of the flesh are manifested. These are all warning signs. And God says a believer can get control over that stuff. See, as you grow in the Lord, you understand that you put away childish things. And you grow up and you just be a man. You start understanding there's certain things you have to take. You have to grin and bear it. You just have to do it. You don't murmur. You don't complain. You don't talk about bad mouth anybody anymore. Why? Because you know yourself. You know how messed up you are. Amen? And so it, it'll help you out. It'll help your heart out and help you from reaping some things that you don't need to reap. <coughs> that's a bummer. It also says yield yourselves unto God. And that's the positive, right? So let not is a negative, and the positive of that, Romans uh, chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, is yield yourselves unto God. Your whole being becomes a useful tool of righteousness in the hands of God. How do I know it? Verse 13 again. Neither yield yourselves, instruments of unrighteousness, unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those, as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. I'm telling you, there's a battle brewing. Because people, these, the, the devil here in our country and the liberals and everything do not like Bush, do not like the right. The right's starting to get position now in this country. We're starting to get more influence. Again, you know, people are starting to wake up a little bit, and the battle's going to be more and more heated. And Christians are going to start having to op open up their stinking mouth. That's all there is to it. Enough's enough. Christians just will not, will not tell, expose the world. It won't be the salt in this country. It just, it's just downright bad. We're going to lose it if the salt loses its savor and the healing power and the pain that it brings when it cleanses, amen? But you have to tell folks what's right and what's wrong. You know, with the right spirit, but you got to say, hey, no, 
Uh, no way, that's wrong. Uh, there's a couple states now that, uh, I, I mean, Massachusetts, I think, is up for letting our queers uh, marry now. You know, there's more and more states starting to get like that, and that's ridiculous. For people to say that that is a legitimate family, even if you're lost, how can two men have a baby? How can two uh, women have a They cannot do that. They cannot procreate, and that is the definition of a family, to procreate. And therefore, they're changing the definition of the family. If they ever do that, there has never been a civilization on planet Earth that survived. When Rome did it, they fell. Greece fell. All those nations fall when that thing starts coming about. It's just like the handwriting's on the wall. But we can, I believe, if the people raise up and, and uh, do what they're supposed to do for the Lord, we may be able to do something in this country still. So I'm not going to give up yet, amen? And I'm not going to tell somebody it's right for them to do that. I'm going to speak up and say, you're out of your cotton pick and mine. You are, you are so stupid, I don't know where you got your brains from. I mean, uh, you know, you two queers go in the back room. I want nine months, I'm going to check and see if one of you got a baby, amen? You know, they're so stupid. <laughs> they're just stupid. It's just the sin of the flesh, the lust of the flesh is taking them completely over. People have no help on the inside. they got no Holy Ghost to God. There's no power of God inside of them. They've given themselves over to these lusts and to these pleasures, and these things have taken them over wholeheartedly. And except for the mercy and grace of God, with the Spirit of God moving like with some kind of great revival, I don't see these people getting out of that. Because it's an addiction. And what they're trying to do is convince everybody that their sin is right. And that's what they're trying to do it legislatively. If they can do it legislatively, then they'll say, see, everything's all right. And then they'll go adopt. And then they'll train those kids to be just like them. God hates that, man. And, uh, and then they try to put us in the section that we're some kind of Mohammedans or some junk like that. No, no, no. They're trying to get us to forget about our heritage of this country, how we started. That's what they've been trying to do for years. And so it's our job to keep it up there, keep it up in the front. The word servant is found eight times, and the word righteous is found four times. <coughs> the theme in this section is serving righteously. Now, the first thing we've been talking about was deliverance from sin by union with Christ, Romans 6, 1 through 11. Deliverance from sin by yielding to God. We read those two verses, and you heard me speak some things. Deliverance from sin by righteous service. Now, that's Romans 6, 14 to the end. That's what we'll be talking about now. <coughs> Serving righteously eliminates the dominance of sin. I better put this down because we're going to have... Did everybody write this down already? That's, that's a good point. My throat is getting... Bad already. Uh, Sam, go get me some water. Amen. Got it right, got it right, got it right. So under that last heading of that we had, amen, what was that last heading? Amen. Amen, Isaiah. Now, where was I? Okay. Under here, we're going to do this one here. Serving. First one we'll talk about is serving righteously eliminates the dominance of sin. Verses 14 to 22. And sin, number two, Deserves, yeah, it does. Deserves death. We have the death of a Christian in relation to the law. You can't read it. It's, uh, okay, we have the death of the Christian in relationship to the law. chapter 7, and then in chapter 8, and I'll just do like those ditto things, amen? In chapter 8, we have the death of the Christian <laughs> in relationship to what? To the future life. Isn't that good? Sure, guys. 
so you can already see there's a pattern. Six, seven, and eight. Six, you have, chapter six, you have the death of the Christian in relationship to Christ. Seven, we have the death of the Christian in relationship to the law. You'll find out how it starts off, chapter seven, verse one, in relationship to the law with a marriage between a husband and wife. It's talking about the law, and then when one dies, you know, that the law is cut off. But anyway, the marriage relationship is cut off. Uh, and in verse, I mean, in chapter eight, you have, we have the death of a Christian in relationship to future life. And eight, we know, is the number for new beginning. So you'll find out the book of Romans is heavy. If we can get all this, some of this stuff down, the main thing today to get down is as we're going through this is to understand your relationship with your flesh. Amen? When it says serving righteously eliminates the dominance of sin, so we don't want you to stop serving God. What we want you to do is slow down enough so you know that you're serving God. Can you get a hold of that? Some people can run, they'll get a hold of God, and then and you've all these guys experience it, you get zealous, you go, you go crazy. You're, you're, you're a zealot with no knowledge. You have no knowledge, you have no wisdom. You're just excited, and you're going surely on the experience of just getting saved. Bow! Like a shot in the dark. Most of those guys and, and ladies that are out there that, that have done this, that haven't been grounded in the Word of God, don't last more than two years. They're backslidden. You'll find them out there all over the place. They're burnt out. They don't understand it. It's, a, it's, it's just not a sprint. It's a race. It's a long race. So you have to know how to pace yourself. And the only way you can pace yourself is to be consistent. Start being consistent in whatever you do. You have to be consistent in whatever you do. People shouldn't look at you and, and, and say, well, well, he goes to church on Sunday morning, but don't go to church on Sunday night. You know? Or wait a minute, no, no. He does go to church on Sunday night. Or wait a minute, he don't go to church on Sunday. Oh, he goes to church on Wednesday. You know, you get these people that go to church on Sunday morning, won't go Sunday night. The next week they'll say, ah, I feel like going at night. I'll go at night. And all of a sudden they'll say, well, I didn't make it Sunday, but, you know, it takes me better. I'll go on Wednesday. And that's their life, and the neighbors are seeing this stuff. And then all of a sudden evangelists will come through, you know, and they'll get all pumped up, you know how they do sometimes, and, oh, glory to God, yeah, we're going to go door knocking, we're going to go witness to everybody, amen? And they'll be out on Saturday, and they'll hit their neighbors and everything. Oh, would you come to church? Would you come to church? Why? So I can show, show everybody that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. It's for the Lord. And, and, and then they try to tell the people that know them that, uh, uh, you know, how good church is, and, and the people look at them and say, well, it's so good, why don't you go all the time? You know what I mean? It comes right back on them. And so the whole object is not the sprint, but it's running that race, the long haul. It's being able to be consistent, and God will get you that way. And what we do is we fight. We fight him, and we get, we get in so much trouble because we're not consistent. See, like, like homeschooling. Uh, Luke, your mom ought to have you at certain times, right, in the morning, and make you do certain things. My kids got a certain amount of paces to do. You have to be consistent in that. If not, how are we going to find out? We're going to find out how many pages you did that day, right? Or what pages you, you got done when you're tested. Well, why aren't these getting done? You're not consistent. See, if you're consistent, there ought to be a pattern. Like with homeschooling, if they say you've got to have a certain amount of pages every semester, uh, then that's what you have to do. If you're going to regular college, secular college, they're going to say maybe, I don't know what you need now, 132 credits or whatever, get a bachelor's degree, I don't know. Is that what you need? I think that's what I had to have, like 132 credits. Well, you know that if, when somebody tells you something, can you handle 20 credits first semester, you know? They'll talk to a good counselor. They'll, they'll look at you. They'll say, well, hey, how are you? I did, I did 19. I really did. And uh, uh, they'll look at what you can do. Some people can, some people can't. So if you can't, but you're still looking at what? 132 credit hours. So if you start off with just, I think you've got to have nine or something first semester. I forgot how that works. 12 in a secular college. You look at that, and you say, okay, this is 12. Well, how am I going to do? You know, what courses do I have coming down the line? Are these going to be easier, or are they going to be harder? You know. And like uh, Charity, I think she got a lot of that stuff up so that her senior year, she can make up and do whatever she's got to do, which is, that's pretty good. Uh, me and mine never had no problem. He made sure he did that stuff. But me, I was, you know, I was four and a half years getting out, not four years. Because I just, you know, petered out at the end. And um, to be consistent, though, saves you stuff. You did in five, but you could do it in four, see, right? Oh, man. No, it's not, it's not legal. It's not legal. When you hire in on a catalog, you can push that and stay with the catalog if you want to. But uh, anyway, when you get a consistent thing going and people know, they know when you go to church, they know what you do, and they look and they say, you know, this guy's got something together here, so my life's a mess. So I'm going to look at this person, I'm going to say, he's together, maybe he can help me out. 
And then we show them the God, which is always consistent. You don't find God erratic in that Bible, man. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's just like, Dr. No, he's just like that. He just goes like this. So if our life is like this, the older you get in the Lord, you'd ought to start going up here where people can, you know. And that's the hardest thing. <clears throat> but serving righteously eliminates the dominance of sin, verses 14 through 22. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin, because we are not under the law, but under grace? And please show people this. God forbid. Pentecostals, holiness people, think that we believe in eternal security, so we can just live like we want to. And some Christians display that. You know, my Bible teaches that, bless God, you just about can. But, God forbid, because you're going to reap in the flesh what you sow down here. And you get, you get all the way up to verse, um, verse 22. We'll just go right to verse 22 so you don't have to read the whole chapter again. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end after last, everlasting life. Fruit unto holiness, huh? Yeah. Yeah. You lead somebody to the Lord. Holiness, right? You're doing right. That's all holiness. That's holiness. That's holy, holy living. That is holy living. And uh, so if you're serving this way in your mind, you want to do things right, you will eliminate the dominance of sin. I mean, that's just a fact. Right? I mean, you go into that video store, you open up that video store, and you go in there. If you start going like this, if you ain't got a plan to program, best thing to do is just stay out, don't even go in there. You better know the video store. This is on tape, so they're going to say, well, bless God, he's telling me, because you're going to do it anyway. See, I'm just telling, you know, I'm just speaking like, like normal Christian living now. People are going to watch things on TV. They're going to get certain things. That's just life. I mean, people are going to do it. But when you go in there, you know the draw that's in there. You know the draw that's on. If you have cable television with 600 stations or, or something, you know, there's something on it that's wrong. I'm guaranteeing you. And you're gonna, your eyes are going to find it. And then you're ruined, and you know that. And so how in the world can you serve righteously when you're being ruined all the time? See, your mind, your mind is messed up. So you've got to keep confessing, you've got to keep cleaning up in order to even do something right. You know, and then when you do something right, you still got the junk that you put in the last night in your head. So, you know, we can come out and say, well, bless God, shoot the TV, shoot everything, and just go on out there. But now you've got it on billboards, you've got it on buses going down the side of the street. You, man, you got chicks running down naked down the street, uh, you know, you know, going like this, flopping and doing all sorts of stuff, and you get, you're a young guy, and you're over here watching this stuff, and you say, my God, I can't help but see it. Every, and especially in the country. They think they're safe. You know. And so you're watching all this junk, and uh, what are you going to do about it, see? Give a trap. Do the opposite. Do the opposite. No, you just got to get control. You got to get in the spirit because there's no way, no way. You know, maybe in the 50s you could do that. You can't do that now. Now, we're, we're, we're where Paul was. When he went and he uh, started that church at Corinth, Corinth is, was in part of Greece, and Corinth was the worst, was the most lustful, carnal city there was, the port city. And even today you go there, they've got, uh, uh, they, anyway, they got a messed up city. Everything's legal there. And I can just picture Paul walking through. Oh, my God, look at that. Oh, my God, look at that. Oh, my God, I can't look at that. I can't preach to these people. No, he had the power of God. Just all out in the open. All you can do is, is witness and, and just pray God. And when that power of the sin starts messing with you, you've got to either quote scripture in your brain, you've got to get, get a hold of God somehow, and you've got to, Father, I need victory here, man. I can't witness these people from my thoughts like that. I can't, I can't, look how, to, how can I do that, you know? You just got to shake yourself a little bit and reckon yourself dead and say, you know what, they need to get saved. You got to see them as a soul. You know when they get saved, they get under the book, they're going to dress right. That's how you do it. See, Christians aren't doing that. They're, 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 they don't want to make anybody feel, feel bad in the churches. So all they're doing is they're bringing the outside into the churches now. So the chicks can come in with bathing suits, halter tops, hot pants, you know, and the men are going crazy in the churches. I don't know how anybody could, you know, that's garbage. 
you got to have power outside. In order to have power outside, there's got to be power inside. That's in your body and in the local church. You've got to have the book, you've got to have good preaching. Also, sin deserves death and receives death in verse 23. We see that, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what it says. The wages of sin is what? In other words, sin gets its pay, and that's death. So whether it's your stinking body doing it or not, it's going to get its death. And if you're a Christian, it's already had its death. Right, Luke? So you don't have to think bad. You don't have to do wrong. You're not, did you write all this down already? Good boy. Right? I mean, if you want to lie, if you want to be mean on your mama, because you ain't got nobody over to beat you all the time, man, you know how to do it, don't you? You know how to be slick. Well, who is that? Is that the Luke on the inside, the one that Jesus saved, or is that the outside? That's the Luke on the outside. Because you know that, because if you break your mother's heart, or if you hurt your sister, or hurt her bad, all of a sudden you feel what? In your heart, you feel bad, right? And that you know the Holy Spirit says, you're wrong. You need to get that thing right. See, when a child gets saved, they get the Holy Spirit of God. They've got a witness inside. Now they have to be trained on how to do that. So you guys, you're... You're all of a sudden, the uh, Lord gives you a wife. Okay, then you have a child. Now what are you going to do? See, if you're messed up, right, if you don't have a handle on this before you have kids, then you have to learn it while you've got kids. And that's double rough. I know. That's double rough, right? Because here you are trying to get character to give character. Oh, boy, that's bad. Because you don't know how many years it's going to take for you to get the character to give to the kid. In the meantime, the kid's growing up. Right? And we can always look on Bill Miller and say, oh, man, I could have did it better then. Well, what you do is you just have to do it. You just have to go through and do it, get, your, get yourself together, get the kid together. Hopefully the grandkids, you'll be able to work on your kid to get the grandkid better. You know what I mean? Until finally you get to where you're supposed to be. See, people hate sometimes. I remember when Nehemiah, uh, he was really getting plugged in there for a while, and people just didn't want to hang around with him. They thought he was a little snitch or a little weasel. He didn't want to do certain things. He didn't want to dress certain things. He didn't want to go certain places. But all he was was getting personally responsible for himself. Some other kids had to get older and get revived, you know, and go through a bunch of preachers and say, you know what? Man, I need to do this, this, and this. But me and mine was already doing that years ago. So we just plugged in. It takes kids sometimes, different times to plug in. I mean, I, in, in our house, we'd have some, all of a sudden something come on, he'd just leave the room and say, I'm going to bed. You know, I'd be under conviction. I said, what was it? Because this was before we had a cuss bus or anything, man. I was getting used to that. And we ain't got no cable. We ain't got, I mean, it's nothing that somebody would think would be real bad, but it was enough to make him move. And I'd just sit down and say, well, and everybody'd say, aw. Then I, as a dad, I'm sitting there saying, what did he do? And God started showing me, well, you know that commercial, that mayor commercial, them legs and all that stuff? Come on. Oh, yeah, come on. I went to my wife's magazine today when it comes in the, 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 the papers, the sale papers. Making sure I get them first, right? Before anybody gets them pictures. She said, come on, not them pictures. And I goes, yeah, even them sale pictures. Well, do we have the, do we have the sickness and the, and the after uh, meeting uh, blahs here? Ha, ha, ha. I know it's rough, but um, I'll try to give you the information whenever. I figured today would be a rough day, period, for everybody. But um, you have to get a hold of that now. If you don't, then see what you're doing is when the little kids are growing up, they're seeing what you're already callous to, what you're already used to. You know, you know I got, uh, I ain't getting all that, but anyway. Well, it's only 8 o'clock, so I still got some time here. Don't I? Yeah. You, mercy's sake. And then the last one over here was, this wonderful life is in Jesus Christ, and we know that. We know that, we know that, we know that, that it's in Jesus Christ. And um, <clears throat> we think about death being uh, with baptism. You have spiritual, and they're both spiritual. If you go to verse 3 first, look at Romans 6, 3. Church of Christ, in other words, will try to use these as water. You cannot find water anywhere in these verses. They are spiritual, man. So in, in, in Romans chapter 6, verse 3, it says, Know ye not that so many of us as were... This is Paul now. 
we're baptized into Jesus Christ. It does not say water. You're baptized into Jesus Christ. We're baptized into his what? His death. Now go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. Sometimes in your Bible, I've got different Bibles. There are a ton of different Bibles. I love Bibles. But if I got a wide margin like that, I would, like if I was in Romans 6, you know, 3 like we just were, and I go over to uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 12, I'd put that, that reference right next to 6.3 in case I ever come across a uh, water dog, we call him, amen? And uh, that's Church of Christ. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, look what it says. For by one water, no, it says for by one spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, are we all baptized into one body, not body of water, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit, not water. These verses are not, they see water in anything that they do. The Catholic Church does the same thing. I've got all, so much information in chapter 6, we just got started. Real water baptism, the death, burial, and resurrection, is a figure, is a figure of what took place. Figure. In Colossians 2.11, it talks about putting off the body. Putting off the body. I can see now I'm going to have to do, uh, I'll, I'll have it on tape. I'll just teach this today. And I'm going to have to get somebody to type this stuff up. I got, I got a bunch of stuff. I'll just give you the handout. It'll be easier for you, I think. But, uh, hush up, you little lazy bum, you. Hush up. But I want you to get this. There are three attacks on baptism. There are three attacks on baptism. The first attack on baptism, and we have about uh, 20 minutes here, is ultra-dispensationalists. Ultra-dispensationalists. Those people that want to divide, 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 that believe nobody got baptized after, you know, they're saved and so forth, really born again and saved in our dispensation. Here's what they say. Since there is only one saving baptism, other baptisms should be eliminated. In other words, going to 1 Corinthians 12, 13, they said, see, there's only one spirit, so there's only one baptism, one faith, one God. Since there's one, one baptism is spiritual, then there shouldn't be any water. That's the ultra dispensationalist. That's the first argument. We'll get back and answer some of these uh, probably next week. You have the Campbellites. That's Church of Christ. What they say is this. This is the other attack on baptism. You have to have the Holy Spirit to be saved, and the only way you can get the Holy Spirit, according to Acts 2.38, is through water baptism. And they do believe that. And then the other attack on baptism, the third attack is holiness groups. Holiness groups say this. You can be baptized in water, but not get the Holy Ghost. Getting the Holy Ghost is evidenced by speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues. That's those three arguments, amen? You see that? You got those three down pretty much, I mean? I mean, those three things. One believes that there's no water baptism because of why? Because of one spirit, one, one faith, one God, one Lord, rather. Remember that? Therefore, that's spiritual, so we don't need no water baptism. The other one is the Campbellites that believe that you receive the Holy Spirit after you get baptized, according to Acts 2.38. And the third one is the holiness people. They believe you have to have the baptism, but it's, you didn't get the Holy Ghost unless you speak in tongues. Now, in answer to that, to show you what happens, these are three attacks made on Bible-believing Christians. All right? Number one, the first attack that you just wrote down, that first attack is made to break up the local assembly. What do you mean? These people will get into Bible-believing Baptist churches and they will split it. They sow discord. You know? Hey, I know you believe this, but, why, but this is what we believe. Don't it say this over here? And then they buzz behind the scenes. And get everybody thinking like that. Start killing the church and split the church. 
They will over that issue. Then the second attack is, uh, this we're talking about Bible-leading Christians, is to proselyte the child of God. Proselyte means to take him out of what he is and bring him into their belief. To proselyte the child of God into a Judaistic situation where he'll be dependent on the works to save him. Campbellite. Sort of goes with the other one, too. In other words, they'll proselyte you, get you into their fold, and since you had to be baptized to get saved, now you're going to have to do all these things and keep the commandments and everything to keep saved. That'll be in there. That is in that doctrine. You will have to do certain things. They get you under the Judaistic things. They like the law. They like everything in the Old Testament, and they push that on their, on their people. And thirdly, the third attack is made on the indwelling Christ. That's those holiness people. So the believer will not realize that Christ is in him unless he talks in tongues. That's an attack on Jesus Christ, you see. Now, what does a Bible believer do? A Bible believer carefully avoids those three. Just avoids them. Because it'll ruin you. You know? Well, you have to avoid it. Yeah, buddy. Oh, they're dry as soda crackers. That's it. Yep. Yep. And plus, you see, I, I, I don't know if I have it all written down here, but I got all the verses where people were baptized. Paul was baptized. Christ was baptized. I mean, all these people were baptized, all right? I mean, we're talking water baptism. Yeah. Well, they'll probably put him in another dispensation or something. That's all. They'll chop him up. Yeah, he wasn't. He wasn't there yet. So, <clears throat> and also in in chapter six, verse six, or in Romans, we just stopped there for a little while with the baptism, so you get that down a little bit. Get a little help there. Watch out for people that go there. Nobody got water baptized. Yeah, right. Crispus and his whole house in Acts. A ton of people got baptized. Amen. And um, they'll say, well, Paul didn't baptize. No, he says, I thank God I haven't baptized any of you. That's all he's saying. Yeah. You know, they're so stupid. They take something like that. All that means is he didn't baptize none of them. It doesn't mean he didn't baptize nobody. And see, we're not saying that you're saved by baptizing, but it's a figure. The Anabaptists and and all the Bible believers throughout the ages died because of that issue. Because we believed you had to be baptized after you believed. And uh, uh, what's the big thing coming now is, is, is this uh, Reformed theology, which is uh, a lot of Presbyterians and uh, uh, Lutherans and all these kinds of things, you know, like Martin Luther and everything, where they, they believe that a baby needs to be baptized, you know. And uh, they've got no scripture on it, no scripture whatsoever, period. We'll cover that one day. But here in, in chapter 6, verse 6, uh, it says this, it says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So it says, is crucified. Notice it says that. You see that right there? Is crucified. Not going to be crucified. Is. Right now. Is crucified. If you reckon it. Knowing I am crucified with Christ. That means right now. There's some other verses you can put by that. Uh, Galatians 5.24. I guess I can go there. Let's go to Galatians 5.24. We got another 10 minutes. Yeah. 5.24. See what it says there. I got it written down here for a reason. Yeah. 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 In Galatians 5.24 it says this. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the, affle with the affections and lusts. How about that? And they that are Christ. Are you Christ? Are you Jesus Christ? Do you belong to him? Yeah. Then past tense, you've already crucified the flesh. It's already been crucified with the Lord. But present tense, you're being crucified. That is crucified. But you have to reckon that. That's where the mind stuff starts happening, don't it? 
That's where all of a sudden sin starts having dominion over you. You start saying, wait a minute, bud, you can't take over me. I'm crucified. And that's when you've got to get down to business, buddy, because that body will say, oh, yeah, we'll see if you're crucified. And you say, I told you I'm not going to do that no more. And the body says, we'll get to this in chapter 7, but do you understand what you're going through? You know, you understand what you're going through, Luke? Like, you know, if you watch something bad or you think something bad, right? You can say, no, I'm a Christian. I'm not going to do that. And the body says, yes, you are. He says, no, I'm a Christian. And the body says, oh, oh we're going to find out. And all of a sudden, you keep talking to your body, and then guess what happens? The body wins. What kind of a game is this? Well, let me ask you this. If we go out to that cemetery down here, all right? You go out to that cemetery, and you talk to them people, and when they come up, you let me know if they ever come up. They're dead, aren't they? Dead people don't talk. Dead people don't have no feelings like that. They're dead. So when you get those feelings and those emotions, why are you talking to a dead man? Why are you talking to a dead person? If you're talking to a dead person, then guess what you did? You made that dead person alive. Now, you ain't going to get this all the time. If you can get to the spiritual level and get a hold of what I just said, it'll, it'll, it takes a while to, to learn that. In other words, my body says, yeah, you know, the first thought of sin. And I yield to it because I'm thinking about it. So I'm actually yielding to a dead person. This person is supposed to be dead but I haven't reckoned it a dead. I'm really believing it's alive. So next thing you know, it's bigger than I am, and it takes me over. Right? You know, if you got a picture, you look at a picture of a girl, and it doesn't do anything because you saw her head. And you start working down that body. If it's not dressed properly, for a man, he knows what's going on. He'll look at that thing, and all of a sudden, boom, this will catch his eye. When it catches his eye, he's almost ready to yield, isn't he? So that's when you've got to catch it. You've got to nip it in the bud before that happens. If you don't, you're gone. Why? Because you're building those building blocks of your sin. Hey, man, when I, when I, when I ask... <laughs> When I found when that guy come into that, that, that catwalk when I was in jail, and he says, well, if you're saved, why are you smoking? I says, I know it's wrong. I didn't, I didn't cop out. I, I just told him it was wrong. He goes, well, man, brother, you ain't supposed to be doing that. I says, okay, so? I mean, I didn't know. And so I'd go to God, and I'd say, well, God, you know, I want, I want, I want to get rid of this stuff. So I'd tell my wife to bring me different cigarettes. I went from Cools to Camel. You know, you know, the, you know the, the sort of like slow down. Next thing you know, she come to visit me, man, my fingers are stinking orange. What are you doing? I said, I'm smoking them stinking camels down. The, I'm smoking more now than I ever smoked. I said, I'm going out my stinking mind. I said, bring me some Garcia Vega cigars, man. She brought me them cigars. I said, I'll show that stinking flesh. <laughs> yeah. Because I knew I wouldn't, no way I'm going to inhale a cigar, right? So I'm smoking cigars all day, doing pretty good. About 11 o'clock at night, you know, everybody's sleeping. I lit up a stogie, and I'm smoking. All of a sudden, I decided to inhale it. And it hit me like a shotgun. Boom, first hit. Second hit got easier. Third hit, I hit my knees, started crying. I said, God, you know I'm trying to stop. Now I'm in hell with cigars. Uh, but I was cussing at him in my prayer because that just was my vocabulary back then. And you know what he did? He touched me. He saw my sincerity, and out of his mercy and grace, he did touch me because in the morning I had no urge. I got up, and I just didn't have an urge, and I knew that was him. I didn't start getting an urge again until about 60 days later. He let me have 60 days of grace, it seemed like, you know, just to show me I could do it. And uh, then the battle was on a little bit. But that battle was I had to stop. I couldn't even sit down and watch somebody across from me do it because I'd inhale with them. I'd look at them and go, they put on, they put, I'm serious. <laughs> they put on TV. If you didn't smoke, you don't know what I'm talking about. I, 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 you know, you put on TV, you know, and all of a sudden, you know. Especially them old movies because they wouldn't let us have, now they let them have cable now. They had these old movies on. They smoked like, man, crazy. Frank Sinatra, them. <laughs> Everything. Women smoke. I mean, it was just like, I'm, I, couldn't even, I couldn't watch that junk. I was, I was breathing with them. I was exhaling. I said, man, I, I was going to beat somebody up and get me a cigarette. <laughs> and, but something inside of me says, well, stop 
you know, once you feel yourself going over this, it's like a drunk. You know, sin, sin a drunk, it's not a disease, it's a sin. But it's one of those sins of the flesh. When you, when you have that urge, you've got to, the Holy Spirit will give you warning. The Holy Spirit will work with you because it cannot leave you. It is the comforter, it's a teacher, it's a judge. It convicts you of sin, righteousness, you know, judgment to come. I mean, the Holy Spirit does that. So growing in the Lord is allowing yourself patience. You know, you don't give up in your struggle over sin. You don't give up. Why should you give up? That's stupid. If you give up, you'll give over. You know, I've been on a diet uh, about 20 years, amen? I'm not giving up. Two weeks, I'll probably try another go. Amen. Why not? Because I know where I will be if I don't. I'll be going another suit size. I can't be affording these anymore, man, going up every few years. And so um, I'll try some again. Why? Because it's a stinking flesh. That's all it is. You know, I'd rather have sweet potato pie than broccoli. You know, I've got a bowl of tapioca now. It's lasting me about three, four days. I used to sit, eat, eat that sucker one day. I'm talking about this bowl is this big. <laughs> I am serious. Because the ice cream that I ate, I had my own bowl. And I used to do the ice cream the same way. So I figured, well, I'm not doing ice cream now. I do the tapioca. Was my body, you know, I'm trying to switch one with another with my body. But I said, that's cool. I started off with a nice little bowl, you know. And then I just, I just, I said, well, it's there, it's mine. If it's mine, I can eat it as much as I want to eat it, see? And you just, it's just the way the flesh is. Whatever you give the flesh, it wants more, you're never satisfied. And, and being a dead man, according to Scripture, being a dead man, my goodness, you are right now trapped in a body that's dead, chained to a tree, oh, wretched man. You're dead and you're nailed to a tree if you reckon yourself dead with Christ he was dead and he was nailed to a tree and he can't move he's got no power he's dead so for us to get that new man built up that strengthened in the inner man that Paul talks about you got to start reckoning yourself dead more you got to start practicing this Christian Christian life and walking in the spirit not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. doesn't matter how old you are. If you're Luke's age, Isaiah, Sam, or, or Kezia there, it doesn't matter what age you are. You know, if you're saved here today, you know, bless God, when your body's doing wrong. Because when that body becomes alive to you, then it's alive onto the law. You got that? When this body is alive, it's alive onto those commandments of God, isn't it? How do you know that? Because you break them. And the Holy Spirit says, hey, guess what? You blew another one. Here you go. You blew another one. You broke another one. And then the peace of God comes in and says, well, thank God I'm not going to hell. Thank God I'm not under the law. Well, if you're not under the law, why are you walking in it? If you walk in the Spirit, you're not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh, you're not going to break the law. You're going to be a happy camper. You know, but that's all part of this <clears throat> chapter six. And I knew we were going to have to teach this twice. Because, I mean, you know, two days. Because there's just too much stuff. And once again, like I said before, you look out at a graveyard, there are, uh, all those people are free from sin. All those people in that graveyard are free from sin. There's no whoring around or dressing like you want to or drinking or doing drugs or getting drunk. They're all dead to sin now because we're all in the grave. So that's why in verse 8 there, chapter 6, when it says that in verse 8, amen, Romans chapter 6, look at that sign here. It says, now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, verse 8. Now if we die with Christ, he didn't stay dead, he came up. So if we died, we also have been what? Made alive made alive and that's what shows you or not shows you but it gives you assurance of your salvation is the fact that you can get victory over sin and that's why this reformer unanimous thing I like is because it's not a 12 point or 13 point or certain steps they don't say that you have a disease they approach it as that dual nature you, you, you're, you're a sinner and most of them get saved you know, before they get through the first book 
because it's all about their relationship with the Lord and what sin does. And after they're saved, see, you can work with them to show them how they get victory. And it's all pointing to the Word of God. It's all pointing to Jesus Christ. So it's the same with you and I, you know. You got to get a hold of that thing. You got it's a daily thing. It's a daily walk. It's putting on the whole armor of God. It's it's reckoning yourself dead when those desires and, and the old man starts to come up and starts to get aflamed. You got to you got to put that flame out and say, "Look, sucker, you're dead. Shut up. I'm serving God today." You know, and that's that's that consistency. That's that character that you get. That's why we get mad at some people sometimes when they seem like they got it together. It's because we don't have it together. You know. So we don't get mad at people that got it together. Get mad at yourself, amen, that you're giving in so much. But uh, So we'll continue this uh, later. Take a break.